right, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, and welcome back to IT Pro TV. I'm your host, Don Pizzetta, and in this episode, we are diving right back into the world of CompTIA IT fundamentals, specifically taking a look at collaboration software, a little variation on the software products that we've already been looking at. And here in the studio to help us take a look at, at what collaboration software is and does and why we care about it is Mr. Ronnie Wong. Ronnie, thanks for joining us. Well, Don, thank you for having me on the set as we continue to go through and take a look at additional software. Now, in the previous episode, we did end up talking about the idea of productivity and business software. And when I start to think about that, it's usually for one individual working and doing what they need to. And at that point, that actually works out just fine. But we know that business is all about making things more efficient and even more productive. And the way that we can do that at times is when we start working with other people as well. Now, when we start doing something like that, that begins to kind of, uh, you know, say, all right, so what do I have to do? Well, do I want to interrupt Don? He's in the middle of something. And I go, all right, Don, no, I need you to work on this with me. Uh, so I'm about to send you something, but give me five minutes. And so Don's like, okay, so there it is. No, what we can do today is we can use some type of software or category of software that we call collaboration software. And this will help us to be able to work together at the same time without really disturbing a lot of processes in place so that we can just kind of do what we need to at the moment as well. So that involves things like email. We want to make sure that we understand the idea of working with email. Conferencing, conferencing, which I can't say, conferencing software, online workspaces as well. And then we also want to show you how we can even edit the same document at the same time. So that way you can see that it's live time editing is not me editing one copy and then Don editing it. And then like, when did Don make that change? Was that before or after I made the change? So it's really powerful software that we can actually jump into and be able to use. All right, well, Rania, a good place to start is probably with something that, that everyone uses. You mentioned email. Everybody has an email account, and we use them for all sorts of things, and it's probably one of the, the most commonly used collaboration softwares because if you think about it, the whole purpose of email is to talk to somebody else. It's more than one person. If you were the only person that had an email account, it really wouldn't be useful. <laughs> You'd send your self notes, I guess, and then that would be it, right? But this is collaboration software that everybody uses. So let, let's talk about uh, email software and, and, and what, that, what that is like. Right. When it comes down to email software, what we want to actually be able to do, of course, is not only send email, but receive it and make sure, of course, everybody gets uh, the email that we actually want it to get to. So as Don was suggesting, what I could actually do is create a letter to someone or a small note to someone, and we can just do that between us. I can also at the same time say, hey, there's actually a group of people that I want to send this to, and I can send it out to every one of those individuals in that group as well. So we want to show you at least one of the email clients that's out there, and that's what we're talking about here, is that when you and I want to interface, in other words, to send email, there's a whole big structure that's in place to make sure that email gets from one location to the other. But when you and I actually want to create an email and to send it, we're using what we call an email client. And I'm going to use the most popular one that's probably out there in the business world, which is called uh, Microsoft Outlook is the one that I want to actually do. Okay, so let's take a look at my machine and we'll at least show you here. So I've opened this up. I've launched it from my Windows 10 machine. If you're not sure how to do that, there's a couple of ways down here in the lower uh, left hand corner. I can click, of course, on the Windows button and then scroll all the way down to Outlook. And you'll see there's the launch uh, that we can do right there. Or you can just type in the search, the word Outlook. Actually, I think if you even type in email, it automatically brings it up. Let me verify that before. Let me see. So let's say, I don't know exactly what I want to do. I want to send an email. Yep. Notice that it actually associated the word email right here, Don. The best match. It says, hey, it's right here on your desktop. Uh, there it is. It's ready for us to go. So this side, once you launch it up, you'll probably end up seeing that it will look something like this where it is connected into, well, your email account somewhere, okay? Now, I've actually got an account on Gmail that I've connected this to. Uh, so, and you, you might wonder, well, how do you get that connected? It walks you through a wizard. So unlike what it used to be where you have to try to figure it out, most of the time today on the very first launch, it says, who do you want to connect this to? So if it's your business, you kind of point it to your business and ask you information that you add in. If it's just something like Gmail, you do the same thing and go, Here's the account that I'm already using, and it connects in. Now, it means I don't have to launch a web page to get access to my email, which is how I'd normally have to do it with Gmail here. But for us, once I do that, I am now connected through my account. And at this point, this client itself is very powerful. 
Notice that I can do a lot of different things up here at the top. And you see somewhere it can actually create a new email. I can archive it. I can ignore some. Uh, I can respond to email messages uh, as well. Uh, create different rules for them if I need to. Uh, you name it. I can do that as well as keep an address book. There's a lot of information right here. So for example, if I want to send an email, I can just click here on the new email button. And then when I do this, I can send an email to someone else. So I'm going to send it to the persona that uh, Don is using, which is going to be Lance at Office Pro Demo Co. And we'll just call this one our first email communication here. And get my mouse unstuck for a moment. Uh, Hello. Thanks for uh, writing back to me. And at that point, I simply click the send button. At least I'm hoping to click the send button. Now that will then, of course, send it from my machine, which originated the email, up to the email server. And on the email server, it will then go and find the receiver's email server. And the email server there will then send it back down to uh, Lance's uh, own uh, box at that point. So as we actually have the idea here, you might go, okay, so what's the big deal, okay? The big deal is that now that I've actually got that, I can continue to do the work that I need. I now notice that, you know, either they're responding back or, you know, later on as I check my email, and there it is. Lance has actually answered at this point, and you can see it's actually alerted me. I didn't have to stop and wait, and I didn't have to go and call and say, hey, Lance, uh, what's actually happening here? Because I know Lance Bass, uh, you know, uh, overall. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, so I, I know this guy, Lance Bass, Bass here. But you, you can kind of see that, right? So it allows you to actually continue to do this, and you can respond to messages in that way, okay? So the email client itself can be very powerful that way. Now, the email functionality, functionality you just demonstrated, that, that's present in pretty much every mail service that's out there. So there's Mozilla Thunderbird, there's... You mentioned Gmail, which is like a cloud-hosted email client, so you don't have to have software on your computer like you're doing now. Um, there are services from Microsoft, like Outlook.com, where it's cloud-hosted. Uh, there's probably a ton of others that if we sat here and rattled them off, it'd run on all day. But email is just one of the things that Outlook does, right? right? In this case, it's that's the collaborative piece, but there's a lot more in Outlook that helps us kind of manage our just our, our day and activity as well, right, Ronnie? Yeah, it kind of comes down to where it's what we used to call that personal daily manager or what was it that we used to have? PDA, PDA the yeah, personal digital, data? Digital assistant. Something personal like that, yeah. digital assistant. It allows us to use software to essentially go begin to manage our own schedules as well as contact information with people that we have. And so it can be very powerful. So it's the main communication tool that we have. Email is probably the most primary use for it. But just when I say that, in our organization, even though it can be the most primary, more than likely, we're also scheduling things with other people, too. So, for example, when Don talked about keeping the, the idea and track of different things, okay, over here in the lower left-hand corner, you can see some of these icons if I kind of uh, hover over. Oh, look at that. looks like a calendar here, Don. If I select that, it now brings me into what looks like a calendar. But what's really powerful is up here on this ribbon that we have across the top where it can show me different views of my calendar. At this one... Uh, it is the default, which is one month. I can focus in on that level and uh, scale it into one week. And uh, it's here that I see that there's a lunch meeting that's also scheduled at this point. I can just focus in on the work week, uh, which for, my, for me is going to be Monday through Friday. Or even a single day when I want to see that diary entry for a day to keep track of things that I want to be able to do. Okay, So all this allows us to be able to, to take a look at what we can actually have set up and you might be going, well, that's just a calendar. That means I can actually go in here and uh, create, a, you know, a, an appointment here. So let's say that uh, probably not in the past. That would be <laughs> terrible. Uh, let me try for Ju uh, July 2nd here. And let's say I have a uh, dentist appointment, uh, which aptly I think I do that week, but uh, I don't even know for sure. So I can actually just put down a dentist appointment just to add it in. Now, if you want to be very specific about it, I could probably edit that as well. But you can see that right now it says 12 a.m., and that's just me typing it in. But if I wanted to be very specific about that, I could probably create another appointment. And if I do something like that, it looks almost exactly like an email, Don. Okay. But then we can do something here and go, uh, let's see, uh, let's put in, uh, uh, we'll say, staff meeting. 
And at this point here, I'm going to go ahead and say uh, we'll do this in Studio Studio 4, where we are today. And on the start time, let me select a date. Notice how I'm just really pointing and clicking. And we'll not set it for 8 a.m. Let's set it for well, our normal time that we might actually have a meeting at the end of the day here. And we'll just do that. Okay. So if I do that and just say daily wrap up. meeting here. Well, or at least let's just put a wrap up meeting because I don't actually have it scheduled for daily yet. But you can actually do that where you schedule it to actually say how often you want this to appear. I can save and close it. And then on my calendar, uh, it should there it is. Okay, I was gonna say it should show up. So now you can see on that time and what you know, time and date it actually shows up here. So that is the beginning process of me being able to manage that. Then I can check, of course, my schedule and see what's actually available if I'm doing that. So the scaling and us being able to set our own meeting is that idea of planning out our day the way that we need to. Now, when you schedule a meeting like that, that's not really collaborative. That's just you tracking your own calendar. But when you were editing that meeting appointment you know, and, and in there looking at the settings, there were several buttons at the top that allowed us to add collaborative features to it. And that's where a lot of the power comes in from using a product like Microsoft Outlook. Uh, the ability to schedule the meeting and invite other people to it so that they get a reminder. Now we've got collaboration. So there's that button up top that says invite attendees. And if you're using Microsoft Skype for business, you can actually turn it into a Skype messaging meeting, right. which now gives you the ability to do voice and video as well. And now you're not going to a meeting room, you're doing it online. And, and that that is a, a ton of power all baked into this. And that's where you'll see Microsoft Outlook deviate from some of the other products that are out there. They may or may not have that, or they may have an alternate way of doing it. So know that not all email clients are made the same. Some of them have features that others don't, uh, but it, it really does bridge that gap between just tracking your own calendar versus becoming a collaborative powerhouse. And, and if I do this where what Don was suggesting, where I invite a, a, um, an attendee here, then I can just simply send that. And what that will end up doing, of course, is not only changing it in my calendar as well, but also getting a message over to Lance. And Lance will then see an invitation to this meeting. And when we start taking a look at that, then he can either say yes or, or what is it, tentative, no. and uh, uh, You can accept. accept. Uh, yeah. Tentative, shoot, I already yeah. accepted it. So I <laughs> no. Yeah, it's, or reject, I think, something like that, whatever it says, or I can't make it. But it actually allows you to do that. And now I don't have to actually go, all right, I don't know if Don's attending. I know he invited, you know, I invited him, but I don't have a clue if he's attending. And at this point, I would also get that message of whether or not they're actually attending. You can even mark like required or not uh, mm -hmm. if you want the attendance. So there's a lot more that's actually right here to be able to do if you chose to. You can even, of course, have your contacts. And that way you have your, I call it a Rolodex, Don. Most people might not know, know the idea of a Rolodex anymore your appointment or your, uh, your uh, own uh, address book here. You can even keep your own scheduled task or your own task uh, and to-do list. So a lot of different features and functionalities right here inside of the Outlook client that help us out, okay? So uh, it's really powerful in that sense. Now, Don, I hinted at this a little bit earlier that this is only one side of the, of the email itself, right? It's where I, ha as a user, interact and do what I want to, but in the background, the actual thing that makes it work is actually stored somewhere else. And it could be that it's a server right here, you know, on site, but it could also be in the cloud as well. Okay. And so when we start to take a look at that, right, that means it's sent somewhere else and then we're actually connecting to that server. And that is what's actually driving the whole thing in the background too. And that that's an interesting point because like uh, you're using a Gmail account, right? Right. And in theory, you could do it entirely in the cloud where you go to Gmail's website to log into your mailbox and you see everything. Or you can do it what you're doing, which is where you're running the Outlook client locally, locally installed, and connecting to their server over the internet. Uh, on mine, I'm, I'm logged into that Lance account using Office 365, which is a cloud-hosted service from Microsoft. So I'm going to outlook.office.com. I'm logging in as Lance. I don't have Outlook installed on my computer I don't, I don't think I have it installed at all. I definitely don't have it configured if I do have it installed. So I just go to a web page, I log in, and here's, here's that, that email uh, communication that Ronnie sent me that I was able to reply to. So entirely web-based. Now, 
for companies, this is a hard decision to make because web-based is super easy, right? I mean, you just flip a switch and it's on and it's done. But you've got a monthly subscription you have to pay. It does cost money. And there might be data privacy issues that come into play. If you're dealing with patient medical records or financial data, you might not be allowed to put that in a cloud email service because email is inherently insecure. It doesn't, it doesn't encrypt by default. There's a lot of stuff there that's weak in the world of email. So companies like that may require that they use a on-premises server. And when they do that, it's up to them to determine what features they want to support and they want to offer. They may not support centralized calendaring. They might not support uh, what's called presence, the ability to know if somebody's already busy or not. Uh, it, we don't have time to go into it in this episode, but like with Outlook, it's got a really cool meeting minder feature where when you're scheduling a meeting, it can pull up everybody's calendar to help you pick the best time where everybody might be available. That functionality might not be available if you're using different services. So it, it just uh, it shows there's a lot of choice out there. There's a lot of variations that might lead us to have either an entirely local, a hybrid, or an entirely cloud deployment of a technology like this. And Don, I think your emphasis a little bit earlier in the episode saying that not all email clients are equal is, is also something you want to be aware of. You might find like some systems that say, oh, here's an email client, and it only does the basic features for you. Sometimes it's just sending the email. So when, when I started, I think it was Outlook Express, I think is the one that was on a lot of the machines. And that helped you to do one thing, really send emails is pretty much what it did. But uh, you might see that there are some other ones here. But by far, this is one that you'll probably see in a lot of businesses as we go through and as we start taking a look at, at the idea. So make sure you're familiar with something like this uh, as you continue on and also for the exam. All right, now email is old. There's, there's no, <laughs> no beating around the bush on that. Email has been around since the 1980s and it has not really changed much in over 30 years. And as a result, a lot of people have started moving to other technologies, non-email based collaboration technologies. One of the most popular ones, I, I know that you wanted to talk about Ronnie, is a product called Slack. Right. And Slack is designed to kind of replace, not, not necessarily replace, I guess, but augment or supplement email uh, to help us collaborate better. Right? Yeah, it, it seems like that the idea behind something like Slack is unlike where if we were doing something like the Outlook client, that would have to be installed on every single machine and then maybe have to be configured and get everything running. Most of the time with something like Slack, which is cloud-based, we're just downloading something and then we can go ahead and put in whatever credentials that we're asked to put in. Normally, we get that through an email, kind of funny. Uh, once we get that and we're connected, it's connected, it's running, it's up, and it's doing what we want to. And on this one, we add in the ability to do what we call instant messaging, which is, is clear. And then uh, either real-time or near real-time, I don't know exactly what, what the real, you know, uh, I don't know if we want to make that much of a distinction of it, but be able to do video conferencing, phone uh, as well. You name it, we can do a lot more in terms of this. And co companies actually have several different varieties of this, but Slack is probably one of the most popular ones that's out there, Don, I think, is what we'll see. It is. And, you know, when you mentioned, like, real-time, Slack, it's pretty darn close. Yeah. I, you really couldn't see it because you couldn't see both of our computers. Yeah. But when, when Ronnie sent me that email, he typed it and he sent it. Now, I had no idea, yeah. it, assuming I was remote. I'd have right. no idea that he was sending me an email. And there was a delay in between before I actually received the email. It wasn't a giant delay. It was like a minute, minute and a half. But it is a disconnect. It's not like you're talking to somebody on the telephone and you have a real-time communication. Email is designed to be asynchronous, right? I might be at home asleep, and he sends me an email. When I get up in the morning, there's the email, right? Services like Slack blur the lines between that. They can be used asynchronously or they can be used synchronously. If Ronnie and I are both online and chatting via Slack at the same time, and he starts to type a message, I actually see a little note on my screen that says Ronnie is typing a message. Like I can see that activity is going on, and it's much more real time. Ronnie, let, let's do a little demonstration of the, the chat functionality in, in Slack. Okay. All right, so I've got Slack pulled up on my computer, and it's a little bit small, but I've created just a direct communication now, the way that Slack works, you can communicate with a whole bunch of people at one time, which is using what's called a channel. We're not going to worry about that so much. But what we're going to do is I've selected Don over here on my uh, left-hand side. You pick the list. You pick who you want to communicate with. And then on the bottom, you can see that Don and I kind of Slack uh, uh, on different things here. Down at the bottom where it says, Message Don. So, hello, we need to do a show on IT Fundamentals. And when I do that, 
it's now actually sent. And as it was happening, if Don was watching this for one reason or another, he would have seen at the bottom there where it would have actually had a little dot, I think, that shows that, or something that looks like it's fading and coming in uh, that shows Ronnie is typing or Ronnie has just sent a message. Uh, and then it shows up on the screen. Sure. Uh, on my side, I get a little notification bubble that lets me know that Ronnie just sent me a message. And if I switch over to Slack, I can cut over to my machine, and on the left side, I can see all the different communications that have come in, and I see right down here that I've got Ronnie Wong, and I've got one unread communication from him. And if I choose that, I can come in here and I can see, hello, we need to do a show on IT Fundamentals. Now, if Ronnie starts to type something else, right, if he's going to do a follow-up message, when he begins to type, See that appeared at the bottom of my screen right down there. Ronnie Wong is typing. I know that he's about to communicate with me. I know he's sitting at the keyboard. And that doesn't stop me. I can, I can communicate back, uh, you know, to say that I, I'll be there. And as I type and send the message, he's sending. See, this is, is basically, basically like um, almost like SMS, yeah. right? Like chatting on your phone, uh, sending a text message. Except it's a lot more powerful because we can attach files. We can attach videos. We can attach audio. I do audio notes all the time where I will, uh, it's faster for me to just say something and, and record it and shoot it over than it is to type up a big email. Uh, and that type of communication is really facilitated by software like this. Now, the instant messaging part, that's not like ground shaking no. <laughs> new stuff. We had, I mean, shoot, we had ICQ and AOL right. Instant Messenger and all these ancient chat programs. Uh, Facebook Messenger, right. which is still very active today. Uh, those all do the same thing. But where Slack goes beyond that are other ways of collaborating. And, and there's a lot of other features packed in there, right, Ronnie? There really is. So even though this is uh, key for most people, because if you're in the middle of doing something, it's easier for me just to type a quick message and go, Don will see it, and that's it, and he's not interrupted in the middle. But if we wanted to, even in the middle of our conversation, all of a sudden I type something Don's not really understanding, up here in the upper right-hand corner, you can see that there's actually, well, like this, okay, which is a telephone call uh, as well, okay? So I could actually select something like that, and now in just a moment, uh, you'll see that it uh, is loading, at least, and there it goes. It actually says, hey, uh, it's sharing the screen and uh, the mouse here. If I want to actually share it, I can actually push this button down here, and uh, we are off and ready to go. And on my end, I see a picture of Ronnie, and I can answer the phone, and... We have to be careful. We're going to get a feedback loop right. standing right next to each other. So I'm going to mute my microphone uh, so that doesn't happen. But now I can see that call with Ronnie. And as we talk, if you can kind of see that square right. pulsing around him, that's letting me know that there's audio. But where this is really fun is if we turn on our cameras, right? So I'm going to turn on my camera here. I've got my laptop camera going. There's Ronnie's. We can see you know, his studio lights and stuff behind us. But now we can have a full video call. And video calls are so much more... Um, Live. I, yeah, I know how to... Yeah. Presence. Presence. Hey, when you're dealing with remote employees, people that are working remotely and they get in there and, and they, 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 they're not in the office with you. They don't feel like they're a part of what's going on. But when they can fire up a video call like this, just that easy, it's like running into somebody in the hallway. And you can have a conversation, you see facial expression, you get tone and, and intent, which you don't get with email. A lot of times uh, we get arguments and things in email because people just misinterpret tone. Here, we get a full experience as if we were, were right there. And, and you're, you're kind of seeing it from Ronnie's side. Or no, wait, you're seeing it from my side. If you take a look at Ronnie's computer, you'll see the other side of the communication. He just he sees me, we, we talk, we communicate, and it was super easy, easy. right? Yeah, it was all done click. through the same system. Yeah, it's, it's amazing on how much that they packed into this one uh, application that makes things actually so easy to be able to do. Uh, so in something like this, this is great if your, uh, you know, uh, your organization has this. But it's not the only system that's out there, too. So don't forget, you may see something very similar to this, if not Slack itself. Uh, so like one that, that we have used in the past is uh, Skype for Business. I always Absolutely. get that, yeah, Skype and Skype for Business. All those are, are kind of giving us the same features here. But Slack seems to be the most popular one. And, and for us, it's been relatively stable. So, <laughs> so we like it, uh, which is what, what we really like here. So this is, is very powerful in terms of collaboration, and you'll probably see this more often than not. If you're supporting someone, right, uh, as, a, as a technician, well, a Slack message, you know, it lets you see they're like, hey, I really need to talk to you, and you can kind of get, get that message as well, and then have a conference, you know, instantaneous conference right there. It really is neat. Yeah, and, and the whole purpose of collaboration software like this is to help alleviate the 
the overwhelming amount of email that we get. I know I receive a ton of email and it is just overwhelming when a lot of things can be answered quickly and easily if people just talked and, and that's what software like this facilitates. Uh, I like that you pointed out how Slack is not the only one. Slack is very popular right now. By the time you watch this episode, <laughs> who knows, maybe some new product has come along and, and taken its place. So um, one of the other features of Slack that I use a lot, uh, you kind of mentioned earlier, Ronnie, is, is document sharing. If I have a document that I want Ronnie to review, I can throw it into Slack and send it right over to him. That when you type a message down here, see how you get this little plus sign? When you hit that, you, you have other things that you can do. I can post a Google Docs file, a code snippet. I can post any file from my own computer, and I can share that in a way that he now has access to it. And that's another type of collaboration where instead of us just having a conversation, maybe we need to be exchanging documents. And in the past, people would email them. But I said email is not secure by default. Well, collaboration software like this, like Slack, it is. This is a secure way to communicate between people. So in a way, it's, it's significantly better than, than what email makes available. And yeah, there's no doubt, Don, that this is this is what does put email kind of in the background in a lot of business because of the instantaneous way to be able to do this and not really have to stop. And, you know, Don gets, I'm going to say, 100 plus emails <laughs> a day. Well, imagine if you had to sit down and go, all right, I've got to answer all 100 of these right now. It'd take them hours to actually be able that, to do That would be my job. That would be your job. <laughs> so here, if it's a simple thing where they need it, they just uh, go ahead and do that and he can just see it while he's working and be able to actually work in that way too. Now, Don, the other thing that we also want to address here is I had hinted it at the beginning of the show, uh, the ability to work simultaneously on a document as well, okay? So that's something that we also want to make sure that, that you can see because that's kind of the true nature of collaboration is us really working on that same project or that same document. So one of the challenges that I've bumped into in, in life is I have a document, and I want to share it with Ronnie, I email it to him, and he makes some changes, he emails it back to me, and I make some changes. Well, each time we email it, we're creating a new version of that document. And then when you end up with that final one, how do you know that you've got the same final one as the other person? It's easy to mix that up, it's challenging. I mean, you know, it happens a lot where people end up with the wrong version of a document. And when you're dealing with like legal documents, that's a real problem. If it's just personal stuff, it's not that big of a deal, you, you sort it out. But when you've got critical business data, you need to know that you've got the latest version. But the other thing is, what if two people want to work on the same document at the same time? Well, traditionally, you can't do that. When one person opens up the document, a second person goes to open it, and they either get that the file is locked and in use, or they get a read-only copy where they can look at it, but they can't change it. Well, collaboration software is facilitated where we can actually be in there and editing the same document at the same time and even see what we're each doing, which is just amazing. I mean, it really demonstrates what technology is capable of doing. And, uh, and Ronnie, are you able to show that to us here on the show? Uh, yes, Don, I can show you this. I've got a document that I've created, and I want Don to actually be able to edit it at the same time. So on Word Online, I've created this document, uh, and it's a proposal for custom training. Uh, that I've created and now I want to share that with Don before we submit that proposal to someone else so that Don can edit it at the same time we can work on it together as I see changes as Don sees changes he can do that too in the upper right hand corner you'll actually notice that there's an icon right here for share when I do that that will of course give me this box and then you have these options right who you want to actually be able to share this with with anyone or I can even select like specific people if I want to so let's say that this one, only the people you specify will have edit uh, to, or uh, access to edit this. And we'll share this with the account that Don's using, which is Office Pro Demo Co, if I can remember that. And at this point, please edit. And I simply send him a link. So I was able to change that, uh, whether it was to anyone or to anything, but I made it specifically to Don so that only he's the one that's going to be able to edit it. Now, when he does this, he should receive an email on his end telling him, hey, I've shared out this document, and he has edit privileges too. Yep, and on my end, I'm, I'm in my mailbox, and sure enough, I got a, an email from Ronnie, and if I take a look at it here, it's telling me that I got something. This link only works for the direct recipient of this message, right? So just for me, and if I come in and I click on that document, it's going to take me into Word Online, and now I'm going to see that same document. Now, I'm just viewing it right now. I just see it, but if I hit edit in browser, it's going to move me into the edit mode. And this is where things get really cool. I see a little bubble up here telling me that Ronnie is editing the document. And over here, 
I can see exactly where Ronnie's cursor is right now. So he's working, we, we might be thousands of miles apart, and we can start working on this at the same time. So when I come in here and click, and I start to add in uh, you know, some new statement of terms or, or whatever it is that I'm adding, he's seeing me add that in real time, just like I'm seeing him add it in real time. And here he is, he's correcting uh, my spelling or capitalization or something. So we can work on this at the same time, and it's super, super cool to be able to do that. And, and now, I mean, just think about all the time it saves you from having to share documents back and forth, email back and forth. Can you review this when you get a chance, send it back? Nope, let's just get in here. And normally I'll do this with a, a phone call simultaneously, right. right? So we're on the phone and we're talking or uh, you know, Skype, right. uh, Slack, something like that. So you can chat. There is some, some basic chat functionality built into the online editors that you can use, but usually having voice is better, right? Getting on the phone and just talking and working through a document, you can knock that work out all at once. And now you know that you're both looking at the same thing, working on the same data. That's really powerful stuff, and that is kind of a core component of any good collaboration software. Yeah, there's no doubt, Don, that this is what makes this idea of working with collaboration software so useful. It takes a little bit of getting used to the first time you do it, but once you get in the habit of doing it, you'll probably uh, kind of see that you'll fall right in and, and it will actually be just fine. Now, if you're not as good with it, people that are really good at it, they don't, they don't really like it, right? Because you'd seem to lag a little bit behind, and like, you're not really good at doing this. Well, it, it does happen, but once you get up to pace, you'll be fine and everything will actually work. So, Don, I think that's a good uh, summary of some of the different types of collaboration software that we'll probably encounter as we work in the industry. All right, so at the beginning of this episode, we did start out talking about email, which is the most common form of collaboration, just simply sending messages back and forth. But we did get a little more advanced. We talked about audio conferencing, video conferencing. We've seen simultaneous document editing and document sharing. These are all different types of collaborative services that businesses are using out there in the real world every single day. So hopefully you enjoyed that demonstration there. Uh, Ronnie, thank you for doing all of that. It's uh, turned out excellent. And for you, the viewer out there, this is a good spot for us to wrap up this episode, but it's not the end of CompTIA IT Fundamentals. We do have a lot more topics to get to coming forward. But for now, signing out for IT Pro TV, I've been your host, Don Pazette. And I'm Ronnie Wong. And we will see you next time. Thank you for watching IT Pro TV.